Hello, everyone. Um, as people are trickling in today, we'll just go through some housekeeping items. Uh, but welcome, and we are here with um, Prania Specialist, Sunny and Caitlin, and we are going to talk cover crops. So this is our Ask Us Anything, um, and this is the second time mm -hmm. you guys have done this. Yeah. Amazing. Yep. Um, so I'll introduce myself. I'll be the moderator today, and my name is Georgia Lewis. So I'm the new off-calf um, on-farm climate uh, fund representative here at Perennia. So it's only been about a month, I think exactly a month today. Um, so yeah, really excited to be here. Really excited to hear and um, see your questions today and excited to discuss cover crops with you too. So just a few little items. Um, some classic webinar housekeeping items. All participants will have their audio and video turned off for the webinar. Uh, this webinar will be recorded, um, so everything will be on YouTube and uploaded later. Um, if you have questions, just go to the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then, so Lindsay, uh, one of the masterminds behind this webinar, she will be posting links and resources and um, fact sheets um, into the chat while we are discussing certain topics around cover crops. So be sure to take a look at that chat. And then what else? So also um, before you leave today, um, we will be putting in a link for the um, webinar, a survey for today, and we really appreciate any feedback that you can give us. So some upcoming learning opportunities. Um, tunnel Talks, that's with Talia, yep. right? Okay, so that'll be January 10th and April 3rd. So be sure to put those in your calendar. Um, February 6th, we have another Ask Us Anything, uh, Protected Egg Edition. So I'm assuming that's gonna be you and Talia? Yep, us okay. two and Talia. And Talia. Amazing, yep. another great session. And then we have on March 21st, the 2024 Berry Primer. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so again, thank you for joining us today, and we're really excited. Um, if you have your CCA and you want to give a scan to the barcode here, this is for some CEU credits. Um, also, since this uh, webinar is sponsored by OffCAF, um, I will give just a quick little blurb on it. I know many of you are familiar with uh, OffCAF or the On-Farm Climate Action Fund, um, but it is a federal initiative um, with the goal to help farmers implement um, some BMPs or beneficial management practices. And those BMPs are nitrogen management, uh, rotational grazing, and cover crops, which we're speaking about today. And with OFCAP, it is um, unique as it um, supplies direct support for farmers, um, but it also helps with um, training agronomists and training certified crop advisors, which is amazing, and also provides funding for sharing and learning opportunities like this. So that's why we are here today. <laughs> and then Lindsay is on board here today. So I don't know if Lindsay, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, maybe you have to unshare I first. Sure. <laughs> if I can do that. Yes, absolutely. No worries. Oh, there she is. Amazing. Here we go. Hi everyone, I'm Lindsay Scott, the off-calf technician with Perennia. Nice to see you all. <laughs> okay. Do you want to get right into questions? Sure. Or no, yeah. no, let's introduce you first. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> so I'm uh, Sonny Murray. I think everybody knows me probably. I've been kicking around for a few years. I uh, look after uh, berries in Nova Scotia out of the uh, Kinfil office. So I cover strawberries, highbush blueberries, and raspberries primarily. Yeah, and I'm Caitlin Condon. I'm the field crop specialist at Pronia. Um, so mainly dealing with cereals, soybeans, and corn. Amazing. Okay, so we have some questions already mm -hmm. from um, our survey and email from earlier. So um, we'll just get into it. Perfect. Um, these are straight to the point. So how deep should cover crops be planted? Yeah. All right. Starting off. Yeah. <laughs> Starting off with some, some good stuff. Um, yeah, it's really it's really going to depend on a number of uh, different things. And so the main one of that is going to be seed size. Um, obviously, your smaller seeds, you want to have closer to the surface so that they don't have as far to go before they emerge, um, where larger seeds are going to get um, seeded a little bit deeper than that. 
Yeah. So as a rule of thumb, I always go back to, uh, you know, the small garden days. We always talked about uh, two to three times the depth of the width of the seed. So I think that kind of comes into to play here a little bit. The problem is sometimes you're dealing with a mix, mm -hmm. right? So which seed do you choose? Um, yeah. Yeah. How do you prioritize that? Yeah. So I, I would go with the largest seed myself. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes they will recommend a depth when you're buying like a pre-made um, mix. So if they recommend a depth, I would go with that. Um, and then I guess my view on it is to kind of split the difference. If you have quite a difference in seed sizes, like you have some really small stuff and then maybe you have um, like a pea or something that's fairly large, I would kind of go halfway in between so that everything gets a, a decent shot. That makes sense. Yeah. The other thing I think we want to keep in mind is, you know, where is the soil moisture? So totally. in some situations, we could be going out in July or August when things are quite dry. Yeah. Where do we put the seed then? Yeah. At that point, you're definitely going to want to go a little bit deeper so that you can make sure you're seeding into moisture um, to really encourage that uh, emergence germination. Not our problem this year. <laughs> not a problem this year you're right <laughs> Didn't have to that. no you could, you could put the seed anywhere and it was going to hit moisture <laughs> okay um so that's yeah good on that one okay yeah. um what is the most common method to seed the cover crops or seed a cover crop i guess it depends but mm -hmm. yeah so it depends on what situation you're in some of these cover crops are getting seeded into a standing crop and there you're pretty limited right you're going to broadcast it you might have a fancy uh seeder that uh has drop tubes or something that gets it into the bottom of the canopy um and then uh you know if you're really into this cover crop thing you might be in a hort crop and have some kind of drill that goes between the rows but i don't think a lot of people have gone that far yet right, right. so that's kind of your in crop situation is typically a more of a broadcast situation. Mm -hmm. And then you have uh, other situations where you harvest your crop and you can drill in or no-till or. Yeah. And I think everything, I mean, we can use a lot of different things here. And the nice thing about it is that there are options for all those different situations. So really, I think it's whatever you have available to you is the easiest thing and, and the most common thing you can, you have to think about some things a little bit different. Like if you're going to broadcast it, then obviously you're not getting as much seed to soil contact. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, there's just, just some different considerations that you would want to take into consideration there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, overall, we can, we can make anything work. So that would come back to soil moisture too. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. It all comes back it to all soil moisture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, next question, how can cover crops be used to improve soil? Um, so soil fertility uh, or crop health? Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I think the easy answer here is uh, legumes. We yeah. know that legume crops fix nitrogen. Um and so that's an easy way to fix nitrogen and, and have that available in your soil for your following crop. Um, I think if we want to get into it a little bit further, then, um, you know, just by using a cover crop and adding more organic matter to your soil, you're really encouraging a lot of, um, you know, biological activity in the soil, which through that is going to make um, your soil healthier and more nutrients more available. So it's not just legumes, um, <laughs> although the legumes are awesome, but uh, yeah, just adding any cover crop is um, going to contribute to that long-term soil health, biological activity and nutrient availability. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think I have much to add there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we're rolling. Well, actually, can we talk about tillage radish for a minute? Sure. And scavenging nutrients, specifically mm. phosphorus. Yes. <laughs> so especially some of those deeper rooted uh, cover crops, they're going to uh, get down into the soil profile a little bit farther than than some of our cash crops or, or some of our other cover crops. And they're going to bring that uh, nutrient to the surface and make it more available. And if you look at the tillage radish, it's been fairly well documented that it uh, pulls phosphorus up from uh, soil profile, uh, deposit it near the surface and makes it more available to the next crop as that 
tillage radish breaks down and the other thing about tillage radish is it breaks down so quick mm. that it uh, makes makes it available to the next fairly crop quickly. fairly quickly. Yeah. And in the case of phosphorus, you know, you want it there early season, so that's not a bad thing either. So. Sure. Well, hopefully I'm not getting off topic here too much, but when it comes to tiller, tillage radish and then phosphorus, and if you have like a harder bed pan, mm -hmm. like are you still, is that tillage radish going to help with that phosphorus that year? Like if, you're, if your soil is kind of compacted, yeah, so you kind of you get kind of two answers there. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's going to make the uh, phosphorus that's available more available, right? So whatever it can scavenge, it's going to make it more available to the next crop. Um, is the question, does tillage radish break up hard pan? Well, I think it gets to a point where the hard pan is so hard that it doesn't break it up, but it certainly keeps it from reforming as quickly. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, and as you do that, uh, the roots of your cash crop are going to explore more of the soil profile and, and you're going to take up more phosphorus that way because you have better root growth. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We have a question in the Q&A here. Uh, oh, awesome. Yeah, we should have mentioned probably if you do have any questions come up, just uh, type them in the Q&A and uh, Lindsay will Lindsay bring, bring them to our make attention. Sure we know. <laughs> Where we find it? Under here the chat, yeah. yeah. Okay, so Chris here. Um, how do we value the cover crop for next year's fertility? Um, when can we count on the cover crop to release at the right time? That's a nice question. Ooh, it's a complicated <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, not going to be an easy answer to that. Um, in terms of valuing, it's going to depend on the species. Um, and it's also going to depend on the amount of biomass you have. And actually, uh, we do have a good fact sheet on calculating uh, nitrogen credits from legume cover crops. So uh, Lindsay will add that into the chat there and, and check that out. But it is going to be, it's unfortunately not as easy as saying this is your standard mm -hmm. nitrogen credit. It does depend on those things, species, biomass. Um, and then getting into the timing part of it, that's tricky too, <laughs> because again, it's some species um, are going to release that nitrogen a lot quicker. Um, it's going to depend on termination timing. Uh, yeah. So I think your best bet would be to start with the fact sheet as kind of a, a general guideline and then um, call your agronomist <laughs> to, to, to try to nail down some of those details depending on species and timing and everything. Yeah, it's more of an art than it is anything. And you're going to gain yeah. it, gain it from experience. Yeah. Nitrogen on its own is hard to manage, let alone introducing another variable to it. So, yeah. And I would say when we're looking at um, like a nitrogen heavy crop like corn, um, we want, we're probably going to want to estimate on the lower side. Like, so if we have a, a cover crop and we think it's got X amount of nitrogen that's going to be available, I think we want to estimate that a little bit low, um, just so that we're not caught without enough nitrogen. And I think that as that as time goes on and as you do that for a few years, then you can kind of get a better feel for how much we are actually getting um, and then can start to maybe reduce those uh, fertilizer nitrogen rates a little bit, so which is the ultimate. I mean, awesome. Yeah. That would be fantastic. <laughs> but yeah, I think we want to take it um, slow and steady doing that. Slow and steady. And I think that points to being able to break up those applications too, right? Yeah. So you have a little bit on your planter and then you can top dress and maybe come in with another top dress. Yeah. And I know that's a lot of work, but uh, a lot of guys have big machinery now. They have the capacity to do that. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So Leah has a question here. Um, do we have any other cover crops that make phosphorus more available? Yes. So I don't know how well documented it is, but uh, uh, buckwheat uh, makes phosphorus more available and then some of the other crops that um help with your uh 
uh, exudates mm -hmm. like barley as well. If you look at the roots of barley, there's often uh, soil globbed onto it, mm -hmm. and that's from uh, root exudates. And those root exudates are supposed to help phosphorus become more available. Mm -hmm. So those would be my top two other picks okay. uh, would be uh, buckwheat and and, uh, and barley. Oh, nice. Yeah. Sure, I'm not missing any here. Okay, so next question: What are some options for fall planted cover crops? It's a broad question. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so, some things that we're going to want to take into consideration there are: When in the fall are we talking? Mm -hmm. Are we talking um, like end of August? fall cover crops or are we talking end of October because <laughs> those are going to be very different uh, options um, and so obviously that's going to depend on what crop you're coming out of so I would say you know if you're following um, a cereal crop then that you're harvesting in August sometime then you've got a lot more options um, so you can look at spring cereals mm. that are going to winter kill uh you can look at at peas even maybe even clover at that point um whereas the later into the fall we get um those options really drop off and so then we're looking at like winter wheat at used as a cover crop or fall rye right. um and we have a video that i think Lindsay will share on <clears throat> excuse me uh, we did a demo out at our field site um, where we planted fall rye at four different seeding rates. And we started at the end of September and planted weekly until mid-November uh, just to see really how late we could push that and what the benefits were at those really late planting dates. Um, and we came up with some interesting stuff. So I would say check that video out because um, if you are in a situation where you're going after, say, corn silage or soybeans, um, then you are pushing, especially this year, uh, pushing quite late into the season. And depending on what your goal is with that cover crop, there could still be some, you know, an option to use fall rye um, at that late date. But what about from a hort, more hort perspective? Yeah, so I think you can get away with I'm, and I'm saying broad generalist statements here, but you can get away with pretty well anything in August, right? Yeah. It, uh, so then you get into the last week of August and the first week of September and things start to narrow up on you a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then if you get into September proper, then things really start to narrow up on you. So if we're talking about September proper, you know, I'd still put in cereals. I'd still put in uh, uh, rye grass, grass yeah. especially if it's early September still, yep. uh, and even uh, tillage radish. Mm -hmm. uh, once you get past the middle of September, your options still are start to uh, thin out and you get much more limited and, and you're looking at more winter cereals than anything. Mm -hmm. I still think they're worth planting. Mm -hmm. I think you mm -hmm. just have to uh, temper your expectations a little bit. You know, uh, you're going to get a little bit of growth there to hold the uh, Hold the soil together a little bit, maybe cut down on erosion, mm -hmm. and then it almost flips to well, it's not a fall cover crop anymore; it's a spring cover crop. Right. So ho yeah. hopefully it overwinters. And depending on what crop you're growing in the spring, like if it's a frost sensitive crop, you're not going to put it in until late May anyway. And uh, you can get you can get yeah quite a bit of time there from when it wakes up in you know late March to to when you're going to plant in May. Um, yeah, there's some, there's some time for that to, to do some good work. And maybe if you put that in, in the fall, um, maybe you won't be able to get in, in the spring. Like maybe it's mm -hmm. too wet to get in early enough in the spring to put something in, um, or, you know, there's really not enough time to get something in before your crop, your crop. Um, so, anyway, yeah. so well, late. There, there can be some some advantages yeah. to those uh, late fall kind of plantings. Well, with our variable winters and springs and thaw, frost, you yeah. know, if you're not getting in, if you're able to get something on late, really late, at least you're having some protection there for those yeah. 
months. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. It's better than nothing. <laughs> better than fairground. <laughs> and especially if you can get cheap seed, uh, you know, you're not going to put, as I said, we're, we're looking at winter cereals at that late date. Um, and you can usually find those for pretty cheap. You don't want to, you don't want to throw a lot of money into uh, a late fall <laughs> cover crop. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's going to do a lot of good for you. Uh, if you're not planting until late May, you can scavenge a lot of nutrients yeah. in that mm -hmm. period that yeah. otherwise, you know, might have escaped because that's your wet period, right? And, uh, you know, if you're into a strip till situation or something, you're you're going to get quite a bit of mm -hmm. organic matter added. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have another question. Great. Um, it's from Heidi. Would you do a spring cereal cover crop in August to plant garlic in the fall? Um, or what would you recommend? Mm. That's an interesting one. Yeah. We should have uh, Tim or Biggie yeah. <laughs> yeah. for this one. But uh, if I was in that situation and I don't know what, I don't know what the crop you're coming out of and when exactly you're planting your garlic. So I think the official line on garlic is you're supposed to plant it before your a week before your first hard frost or something, mm -hmm. some kind of guidelines there. But a lot of people go very late with their garlic planting. Um, so what I would do is I would finish up with the crop I'm in and uh, I assume you're making a beds or something, right? Uh, so I would form those beds and I would plant a spring cereal at that time mm -hmm. and then come back in your late October, November, or December and plant my garlic into it. I think that could absolutely work for you. You're going to plant into it green? Green. All right. And then let it winter kill. Yeah. It's cool. not going to come up anyway. <laughs> You're getting radical. <laughs> that's, 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 getting crazy, okay? <laughs> I, you know, and if you're in a, I assume I'm making a huge general statement here again <laughs> that, uh, you know, if you're planting garlic, you're probably organic, small gardener type person. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I'd come in after I planted my garlic with my Roundup and burn off any of those, mm -hmm. those weeds that have come up. If you wanted to do that, or even having the straw there is going to suppress weeds yeah. too. So, yeah, yeah I, I think that's worth doing. Yeah, absolutely. Be cool. Kind of a cool thing to try out. Yeah, for sure. Why not? Awesome. Okay. Next up, can I plant a non winter variety of seed, say spring barley, in the fall and let it winter kill so I don't have to spray it down? Yes. yes. So that's kind of a follow up. That's yeah, definitely. I, I do just, work. I will add just a little piece to that because yeah. I do think that that's an awesome option um, because it just, it does take the whole consideration about how you're going to terminate when you're going to terminate out of the equation. Um, I think that there's a cutoff date again for spring cereals where the winter cereals are a little hardier, so they're going to germinate and um, grow more in cooler temperatures than the spring cereals would. So I would say, I don't know, like end of September, early October, you'd just switch to. Yeah, I I would. <laughs> it depends on your. Uh, depends I, where you are too. <laughs> it depends on your expectations. Yeah, but I would yeah. make the switch a little bit earlier. Yeah, I, I would be middle September is my latest. Middle September. But that, but that's me and my expectations. Right. Maybe, maybe you're gonna. Maybe you don't want all that growth, right? Sure. But I, I think it's a good way to get your feet wet. Definitely. Because sometimes if you put in and you get a good catch of a winter rye and it overwinters on you and uh, you're in a hort situation, how are you going to deal with all that winter rye come mm. June 1st, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, yeah. Gateway it, to it, cover crop. It's, <laughs> it's a gateway to cover crop. It's going to winter kill. You're not going to have to deal with all that uh, residue yeah. uh, when you go in the plant the next spring. So it's not a bad way to get started. Yeah. Okay. For sure. Awesome. All righty. So uh, what is the difference between incorporating late in the fall when there is no growth happening compared to doing it in the spring? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, I think it depends on your purpose mm. of why you're cover cropping personally i wouldn't recommend incorporating in the fall regardless um, because your cover crop there is going to be such good erosion control yeah. and if you're if you're going in in the fall and incorporating it then i think you're you know i think you're giving up some really easy wins 
Um, but if we're talking termination rather than incorporation, uh, if we're talking about going in in the fall when things have kind of started to shut down um, and you're just spraying it off, yeah. I'm I'm fine with that. Yeah. I don't think that at that point it's going to depend what your spring crop is. So if you're looking at something like um, if you're going into a cereal, for example, then um, I think that spraying that off earlier in the fall is good uh, because it gives you more time for the biomass to start to break down. Um, where if you're going into corn, then and you want to leave it and I mean, depending if it's a if it's a winter rye, say that you're going to leave until spring, then there's a lot of time to be able to get benefit out of the winter rye in the spring compared to if you had sprayed it off in the fall. Um, yeah. So it depends on the crop that you're putting. Depends on the crop, yeah. I think. Do you have anything to add to that? No, I think it comes down to erosion control yeah. and what you're doing in the spring. Yeah. If you're planting an early season crop or late season crop. And seed bed, I guess, too. Like, it depends what kind of a seed bed you need. For a lot of the, like, small seeded vegetable crops, you're going to want um, a much finer seed bed than maybe you'd be able to achieve if you were, um, if you left a, a cover crop still growing in the spring. Right. And you'd have to, it wouldn't break down as much uh, by the time you wanted to see, you might have to do more tillage than you want to. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lindsay's popping up there. Hey, we have another question. <laughs> thank That's you, Lindsay. Great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what would you suggest as an easy cover crop or mix to start off with, um, in brackets here, planting in the spring okay. um, to add into a vegetable crop rotation um, that would require extra, would not require extra effort or input, such as products, Mm -hmm. to kill off before the next season cash crop planting. So we're planting it in the spring. We're going to plant a cash crop later on in the summer. Is that? Uh, the way I interpreted the question is we're going to leave it out for the whole season. Okay. And plant the following spring. Either way. Yeah. So <laughs> a lot of your annual cover crops are a little bit different to put into this situation because like buckwheat is going to go to flower in, yeah. in 20 days and sit seed in 30. So a lot of them are, are going to sit seed so quickly. So you, what is a long season cover crop that you can put in there? I'm going with, uh, I'm going to go with Italian rye uh, as the base. And then what do you want to add with it? Uh, depends on what you're putting in for a veggie crop. Like some guys don't want to get into clovers because uh, it can uh, increase my, uh, white mold or it can increase my nematodes so i'd have a look at okay what do i want to add with that uh italian rye so maybe i want to put a clover in there so i would go with a uh, a red clover to put with it it's gonna get a little bit of nitrogen into the system your uh your rye grass is going to take up that nitrogen and hold it for you for a little bit um some guys don't like to put tillage radish in in the spring because it will bolt on you mm -hmm. and it won't give you that big tuber, but uh, maybe you want to put some in anyway, just so you have a bit of a tap root there. Um, I do want something in there with a bit of a root on it because uh, what can happen in the valley on our sandy soils sometimes is uh, we get into a drought and uh, the rye can burn off on you. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're sitting there in the middle of August with a brown field. Yeah. Um, so I want to get it in early so I can get it established so it can take that drought. Yeah. Um, so the reason why I do Italian rye as my base is because it's not supposed to go to seed in that first year. So mm -hmm. you don't have to be Johnny on the spot with your, with your mower trying to knock those yeah. seed heads off. So a little uh, bit lower maintenance, a little so. bit lower maintenance and so it's there's... going to give you a great sign. Is there clarification? Yeah. Um, just a follow up. What is yeah. the maximum number of species you would include in a cover crop mix? <laughs> They make, they make a lot of mixes. Um, they make some pretty wild mixes. They make some pretty <laughs> wild mixes, yeah, that I don't, I personally don't feel that it's necessary to have, you know, 10 plus things <laughs> because, because then I don't think that there's enough of any one thing that you're getting the benefit out of it. 
my personal opinion. Um, I, uh, a like three, four, five way mix. I think that that's kind of the sweet spot in my opinion. Yeah. So I'm kind of in the same camp as you, but it depends on your goal, right? So what, sure. is, what is the goal of your cover crop? And uh, so in the case we just went through with the Italian ryegrass, you know, I think the goal is to have something that's low maintenance, mm -hmm. that's going to smother out some weeds because I think we're in a uh, uh, port situation, mm -hmm. uh, build organic matter, get some structure in there, right? Yeah. Okay, so the other extreme is, well, my goal is biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So if your goal is biodiversity. Yeah, or like pollinator mixes, like then, yeah, that's, I guess, where the, some of those higher mixes with a lot of like <laughs> a lot of things that are going to flower at different times um would be so good. some of the more diverse mixes that i've had experience with i find that the seeding rate of any one particular species isn't enough to choke out weeds mm -hmm. and you get a lot of weed seeds coming through mm -hmm. and if you're going to leave that for a while those weeds are going to go to seed you have to contend with that in the next year mm -hmm. if you're in a corn rotation not a problem yeah. If you're in a veggie rotation, more of a problem, more of a problem. Yeah. Um, so, and then you have some of those cover crops that are firing at different times and going to seed at different times. So yeah. how do you manage that so that those cover crops don't become a problem? So weeds themselves, weeds themselves. Yeah. So that's, it depends on your application mm -hmm. and your a lot of yeah. our answers are <laughs> it depends but, uh... but but if you took a diverse <laughs> cover crop mix and planted it in uh uh late august yeah it might uh frost kill mm -hmm. before it goes to seed and and uh everything's fine right, right. Mm -hmm. so it, it depends on your application mm -hmm. and yeah. doing a bit of research on the species that you're saying for sure and just knowing yeah what you're what your goal is with that cover crop and and making sure that that matches up with with those species okay yeah awesome so okay can you recommend some cover crops that would be good for season extension crops to be grazed by sheep and cattle <laughs> sure. again, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> again maybe we don't have the uh, correct specialists here in the room we should have uh shane wood or or, yeah. uh, or katie, katie. Yeah, the other others in the room. I think we do have a good resource on that, but uh, yeah, you know, certainly this year, I think with our forage situation, that some of the livestock guys are, mm -hmm. are looking at different things. Um, and again, it depends on your on your rotation. So, and I think we should make some of these a part of our system anyway. So if you totally. if you're a beef guy and you're growing barley for the beef, yeah, then why aren't you sticking some? Uh, oats or or like OP mix, uh, OP in mix after or, harvest. or a little bit of uh, uh red clover in there yeah. after harvest anyway if you don't need it great but if great. you do then it's there then it's there yeah so you know if i was seeding early and i wanted something for fall i would absolutely put a cereal in with a little bit of peas in it get your protein up yeah um you could look at uh, kale and turnips and uh and that kind of thing even tillage radish can be uh grazed that's yes. quite common in other areas and then you can look at some of your fall cereals mm -hmm. um that you can plant in the fall and use those for early season grazing the next spring yeah so your fall rye yep fall yeah. rye winter wheat amazing yep. yeah you can throw the cattle on that let them punch it up before your pasture is ready yeah exactly yeah. i think if you're going to do that though you have to manage it a little bit so you yeah, get for you, sure. If you want the growth, you got to get some nitrogen on in yeah. the spring. And if you want early growth, then, you know, you got to get that nitrogen on in, in yep. April, right? So yep. Don't expect to throw winter rye in and have it there for you if you're not going to manage it. Yeah, no, if, you, if you're going to use it for for grazing uh, <laughs> then you or for any type of feed, um, yeah, you have to put a little love into it to make sure there's enough there to, to really make it worth it, right? Yeah. So oh, we've got all sorts of things yeah. popping up so, here. Yeah, Lindsay put a big, um, a good resource, a good YouTube yeah. video on the, the cover crops for grazing. Okay, we have two more questions here. Um, what do you do when you miss the termination time of a cover crop? For example, buckwheat um, mm. in a berry veg rotation, and then it goes to seed. Mm. 
yeah. cry? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so in a general sense, you know, I think when we're talking cover crops, I think we have to have a plan in place before before we start, right? Mm -hmm. And then I think you have to uh, truth test that plan a little bit. So, okay, if I do miss my timing, is it the end of the world? What's uh, my backup plan? And what's my backup plan, right? If if I'm in Roundup Ready Corn, and got I, a backup plan. <laughs> yeah. Roundup is a pretty good backup. Plan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but if you're in some hort crops that don't have that, mm -hmm. um, what is your backup plan? So I know we often talk about buckwheat and yeah, it'll go to flower on you. And while it's sitting more flowers, your early flowers have gone to seed and set viable seed. So if you missed your timing on termination, I would run out and mow it off before it set more seed, right? I would uh, leave it on the soil surface rather than incorporate it mm -hmm. and hopefully get some of those seeds to... Uh, germinate that season that we're in um my next plan is you know hopefully i'm in a system where i can use uh herbicides so most of your common herbicides will control buckwheat as well um so you know it's just another uh polygonaceae so yeah, it's just another smart weed yeah so if your population isn't horribly high then uh, we can take it out with a herbicide uh, before it becomes a problem. Um, yeah, so I would leave it on the soil surface as long as I can, and then I would incorporate it late before the next season. So maybe if there's anything there, it, it might uh, rot or, or uh, germinate enough and, and winter kill. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing we should know about buckwheat is, you know, once you get a little frost on it, it melts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Yeah, yeah, I feel like mustard would fit into a similar camp of flowers pretty fairly very, quickly. Very quickly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can yeah. see some see that turning into Yeah. It, if you're dealing with some of the mustards, it's more of an issue because yeah. your your seed uh, will stay dormant longer. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it becomes a perennial big, problem. Yeah. 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 Especially if you're dealing with a weird mustard almost like a canola. Yeah. Right. But the uh, the dormancy on buckwheat, and I should have mentioned this in the beginning, is very short. Mm. So it'll it'll germinate quite quickly. Yes. Um, next question here: Are there non-grass cover crops that you'd recommend are best for weed competition? Mm. Vetch. Yeah. So vetch is double <laughs> double edged sword. <laughs> double edged sword. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Talking yeah, about things problems. going turning into weeds. <laughs> So what is uh, what is a good uh, weed competitor that's not a grass? Yeah. So I'd go to buckwheat. So buckwheat, it's going to, depending on what system you're in again, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to control weeds by tillage, maybe. Or, uh, and I know you don't like to till, but uh, in a heart system. <laughs> uh, so that's going to break up some of your weed cycles, right? Uh, but it also comes out of the ground and establishes quickly. Mm -hmm. So I would look at that. Um, anything you can mow helps yeah, right definitely. so you're gonna those annual weeds you can mow off uh and and they're probably not going to regrow if they're annuals right yeah but the cover crop can regrow so even even having anything there is a big help yeah as a competitor and i think some of the things you want to take into consideration are how quickly is your cover crop species going to establish because the quicker it establishes the better it's going to be able to compete and then um and then canopy so like if it's going to close in fairly quickly and, and shade shade out the ground and shade out the potentially um, emerging weeds, then that's that's those are the features that you want to look for. So, you know, we're giving them willy nilly answers here. I know. Let's, <laughs> let's pick one. Let's yeah, pick yeah, one. So, yeah. uh, so buckwheat, yeah. if that works for you. Tillage radish isn't bad. It, it, gets up and gets going quick yeah if you have a good full stand yeah that you, you're not going to use your low seeding rate that's just gonna <laughs> here, here and there here and there yeah you know uh, double cut red clover over single cut red yeah. clover and then we can come in and mow it off if we have to yeah um the other thing i'll throw out there and uh it depends on what system you're in again is uh, if you're in a grass situation can you come through with uh, with a herbicide and, and take care of it mm -hmm. not that we need the extra expense or something, but in some systems that works. So mm -hmm. it's very common for somebody that's planting sorghum and sorghum is kind of that long season 
Mm -hmm. uh, cover crop to come in with a you know a cheap grain herbicide and burn off some of those some of those uh weeds yeah yeah okay I have another follow-up here um okay speaking of sorghum would you be able to use sorghum sudan grass as a cover crop and fall feed for beef yeah so Actually. absolutely <laughs> um <laughs> You you have to uh, manage your sorghum sedan grass a little bit, and mm -hmm. uh, in the past, I've encouraged people not to mow it and let it grow up tall. Um, but if you're going to graze it, I think you want to be mowing it, and so it uh, doesn't get tough. So it doesn't get yeah. tough. So you maintain your digestibility. Um, it, no, it's a long answer. Stay stay with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so every time it comes up to your waist, mow it off. It'll regrow. It, it stops growing when you uh, get into cooler weather. So you yeah. won't get the uh, regrowth uh, for uh, late fall. Mm -hmm. And then you also have to uh, watch your uh, frost, I believe, with sorghum sedan. Yeah, yeah pretty sensitive. Um, and it also produces that uh, toxin. So yeah. you've got to uh, watch your frost. And then I think you're allowed, after so many days, that toxin dissipates and you're allowed to go back in there with beef so there's a whole management step there i'm not that familiar with it anymore i would call katie trotty yeah, yeah. <laughs> discuss it's, that with her <laughs> it's not something you want to mess around with yeah. but when you get the light frost on sorghum sedan grass it's going to die you're not going to get a lot of regrowth mm -hmm. and uh, then you want to watch watch the uh toxicity yeah. on the animals so. That's it. Something to manage. That's it. That's Moving it. Okay. on. <laughs> we need a bell so we can. <laughs> okay. Is there something that you would suggest instead of a tillage radish um, for the taproot benefit that isn't a brassica in a vegetable rotation? Mm. Good. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. So my next thing would be uh, alfalfa. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that fits for you. And uh, you can get less expensive alfalfa seed, right? So you're yeah. looking at a common. Uh, within alfalfa, there's branch root and more of a tap root. So I think you're going to want to look for something with a tap root. Yeah. Uh, it can be a little bit slow to get rolling, right? So you might want to plant something else with it to uh, cover in quickly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the other one would be uh, the sweet clover yellow oh, yeah, yeah. yellow blossom sweet clover yeah uh, depending on your situation but again they're a little slow to get rolling the the beauty of the tillage radish is they're established quickly really quick yeah. yeah next up i would like to clarify uh you mentioned white clover can attract nematodes um you mentioned using red clover does red clover attract nematodes yeah absolutely yes uh, yes okay Anything to add to that? Just not for good. Nope. Okay. All right. So we did submit a few questions prior to the Zoom, but here is one. Uh, for our small vineyard, we want to put it in some cover crops in between the grape plants for nutrient value, um, cut down on erosion, and also to compete with weeds and push the weeds out. Mm -hmm. Which ones would you suggest for the vineyard? Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, we're not vineyard specialists. <laughs> Grapes are not our area of expertise, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll take a stab at it. <laughs> yeah, it's, been, it's been a while since we worked in the vineyard. Yeah. Um, what some vineyard people do is they'll have the, uh, the row with the vines yep. and then they have the grass strip in between. So what they'll do is they're alternating every year which grass strip they work up and plant down the cover crop. Yeah. Um, in doing so, you really increase the uh, nutrient uptake uh, of the uh, grapevine by doing that as well, because mm -hmm. you have no competing vegetation there, and you're introducing a little bit of uh, oxygen there mm -hmm. to the to the system, and and the uh, biology goes crazy for a little while and releases a bunch of nutrients. Yeah. So that that's fairly common to be done, and I think a lot of those guys are using different things in that blend uh, it's usually oats and tillage radish and mm -hmm. maybe there's legume in there as well mm -hmm. um the guys that i've worked in the past they planted that fairly late season so they'd leave the ground bare for a little while which you know may not work in your situation 
but the doing that increases the nutrient uptake of the vines for that period. And then they'll put something in, you know, in August. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's your experience? I, I think you got to manage it a little bit too, right? So if you plant it and it gets tall, it's really going to decrease the air movement and drainage in that. Yeah. I would say that would be my biggest caution. Like I think having something in between the the rows of vines, fantastic. Um, I think the closer you get to the vines, the more potential problems that you would have um, if it's not managed really closely. So yeah, so things um, things growing up into the vines and like Sunny said, decreasing airflow, um, you know, that's going to be a risk to disease development for sure. And there's enough disease development <laughs> in, in, in uh, grapes that you don't want to encourage that. Um, and I guess the other thing I would say with something close to the vines that you're going to have to manage, say, by mowing, um, I think you want to be really careful with that too, because if you're mowing close to the vines, even if they're well established, um, and are kind of nicking those vines a little bit, I think you're going to cause some potential issues there in the, in the long run. Yeah. So if you're creating lesions there and keeping the area wet, you're yeah. just setting yourself up for some, uh, uh, yeah. Cane, cane diseases to move in there and running into some problems down the road. So I think as you're putting the system together, you really got to ask yourself, okay, how are we going to terminate that cover crop? Yeah. And how is it not going to, how are we going to manage it? How are we going to manage it? Yeah. Yeah. Season. Yeah. Good question, everyone. Mm -hmm. There's more coming in here. Um, here's one of pros and cons on using double cut red clover versus crimson clover as a cover crop. Uh, okay. Depends on your crop, I guess I would say. So double cut clover in general is going to be pretty vigorous. Um, you're going to get a lot of biomass out of that. Um, so I think it's a good one if you're using, if you want to do just clover um, as your cover crop, whether that's um, say frost seeded into red clover um, or something else. I think if it's straight clover, then double cut's an awesome choice. Um, Crimson clover, I really like because uh, it's, I mean, it does a lot of great things, both with nitrogen fixation. It's also really pretty. Um, cool. And I think it fits really nicely in in a little bit of a mix. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit more shade tolerant than red clover. Um, so it's good for like interceding into corn, mm. things like that. Okay. Yeah. I, just to expand on that a little bit. Um, if you're seeding in August, your double cut red is probably going to come up and overwinter on you, right? Sure. Yeah. Your crimson clover is probably going to winter kill on you. Yeah. Um, so, so you bear that in mind. Yeah. If you're planting early spring and you're just looking for uh, something to last that summer, crimson mm -hmm. clover is fine. Mm -hmm. If you want it to overwinter, then you're then you're back down to a double cut yeah. red. So I think they have some different uh, win win windows yeah, yeah. To, to, to plant. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. All right. Is there something that you would suggest instead of tillage radish for the taproot that is, okay, I did that, that one. one. Sorry. There we go. Um, okay. How long before planting corn um, should you terminate a cover crop? Or could you leave the cover crop until after planting and terminate it when you were going to spray anyway? Yeah, so it depends on the cover crop. Yeah. Um, so depends on the equipment you have. Depends on the year equipment for sure. Um, all right, let's say let's do a scenario, yeah, I guess. <laughs> we'll do a scenario. Yeah. So let's say you planted fall rye um in the fall, obviously, and you're going into corn the following spring. Um when you terminate fall rye, um, it produces, what's the word I'm looking for here? Allelopathic chemicals. Allelopathic chemicals. Thank you. <laughs> That's why we're a team <laughs> today. Um, but yeah, so it, it produces allelopathic chemicals. Um, so you can't, you know, terminate it and then the next day go in and plant corn. You do have to leave um, a, a couple weeks window between that. The point I was going to add is if 
you lit if you achieve a full stand and it's going to head and you got all this mass there yeah if if you have a sparse stand yeah well then it's yeah you're right if it's a sparse stand then it's not going to produce enough to um be Sweet. super damaging your probably your crops probably going to be able to come out of that um now something like fall rye you could also plant green um so you could plant your corn crop or your soybean crop um, into that living cover crop and terminate afterwards. Um, and then the allelopathy doesn't, it doesn't have the impact. Um, you could also use ryegrass as a, um, in that situation, like as a, in a planting green situation. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's going to, I think the key is that whatever you have, you want to make sure that you're terminating it before it goes to head. Mm -hmm. um, or, or it becomes a problem for your next crop. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think the other thing we want to keep in mind too, is you don't have to plant a full stand of, of any particular crop, right? Right. We could have some tillage radish in that mix. That tillage radish is going to uh, winter kill. Yep. So it's going to thin out that stand that you have to deal with in the spring totally. and it's going to you know, open up that soil profile a little bit and help you warm up in the spring. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other thing to consider in that scenario too is, okay, when are we going to put our herbicides on and what are we going to use? Like we can yes. come in, kill it ahead of time with Roundup and put a residual in there. Mm -hmm. And then we can be a little bit late with our post-emergent yep. herbicide. Give us some time, give us some time to get our silage done so we don't have to be... <laughs> making silage and spraying at the same time, yeah, right? right? So yeah. there's different scenarios like that that I think you got to think your way through. Which for are, sure. Which are pretty cool. And yeah. it gives you some efficiency too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How do you make it work for you? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And then in bringing the equipment piece into that as well. Yeah. You really have to think about what equipment you have available to you. If you're going to be able to, I mean, you have to have a really good no-till planter or no-till drill if you're going to plant into a thick stand of, of, fall rye or ryegrass um or, or you might have strip till or you might have strip till yeah which yeah. would be a really nice situation mm -hmm. um to be able to to use but especially with strip till i'm gonna go off on a tangent here for a second Take away. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah if, if it was a strip till situation then um it kind of protects your main crop so whether you're planting corn or soybeans it's going to protect those a little bit more from competition mm. from the cover crop the green cover crop oh. um that's one thing about planting green is that soybeans if you're starting out then soybeans tend to be the route that people try that with first because they're a little bit more elastic than corn like they'll fill in they'll fill in any gaps right. a little bit more than than corn yeah. um so soybeans are kind of a nice um option if you're going to try that out um no, but with think. strip till, then you're you're clearing that path. You're making it a little easier to establish a nice even stand, um, but still have the the cover crop in between. Okay, lots of scenarios. Lots of scenarios. <laughs> okay, um, what would you recommend as a cover crop combo for apple orchards for beneficial soil activity and beneficial pollinators? Um, would you seed early, or would you seed yearly? Sorry. And once your cover crop is established, how often would you need to seed to maintain? That's a loaded question. <laughs> okay, so what I'm taking away from that question is uh, what cover crops are good for pollinators? Yeah. Um, Soil microbial activity. Yeah. So things that and, flower, and, like and mixes I, that flower at different times are going to be really great for mm -hmm. pollinators because then you're kind of going to have a continuous stream of uh yeah that, that's what i was trying to break up in my mind right. <laughs> you, you you want something that's gonna flower early yeah. and continue to flower so in there and i don't know what crop situation we're in but apples <laughs> what other crop <laughs> uh, on this particular piece of ground just apples <laughs> so i would have a buckwheat in there if you don't care if it goes to seed or not, like buckwheat will bloom for like four to six weeks. Mm. So that, and then you can continue to plant a little bit of buckwheat to fill in your windows if you didn't want to make the system 
too complicated. Red clover, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I go with the double cut so that it uh, will uh, bloom again in yep. that same season. Uh, you could get sunflowers and phacelia in there as well. Um, so yeah, if you're in a perennial situation, I think you could pick a different spectrum of perennial crops to help out those pollinators as mm -hmm. well. So, because uh, I mean, you don't want to be having to go back every single year to reseed right. because that's expensive and a lot of work. So you definitely want something that's going to last a few years. Yeah. And you could mix it up too and plant a bunch of annuals and have a bunch of perennials in the same mix. Yeah. So you get the benefit of that buckwheat in the first year. Yeah. And then late season, you get your red clover and, and your basilia coming on. Yeah. 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 Okay. What cover crops would you choose if you were trying to increase organic matter? Things with lots of biomass. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> Double cut red clover. Yeah. 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 So if I was going full tilt on biomass, I would go, and that was my only goal, mm -hmm. is I would go sorghum sedan grass under seed it to a red clover. Mm -hmm. So, and then you're going to mow it every time it comes up to your waist. Um, the problem with sorghum sedan grass is, again, once you get that first frost, it's dead. So you'll have that double cut red clover come through at the end of the season um, and give you quite a bit. Mm -hmm uh the the other thing i look at is your rye grasses yeah yeah I, that's what i yeah. that's where my head kind of went um because i'm thinking about a shorter window i'm right. thinking about you know you're harvesting something you want a high volume cover crop um yeah some of the rye grasses and depending on how late you're going um i mean oats establish really quickly and can and can put on a decent amount of biomass in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. um, so what about like a pea oat mix? Oh yeah, I love a pea oat mix. Yeah, yeah. Pea, pea oat mix, yeah. especially yeah. planted late in season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you get sure. nitrogen in there, and yeah, okay. Yeah. Emergency feed. It's pea yeah. oat. Pea oat mix is great. Give her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the last one is oat. Oh, oh, let's see. Oh. I think we're getting the. Uh, we're running out of time. Oh, no. Only two minutes left. So there's no questions. Do we want to have one more? Sure. Um, there's going to be a little lucky. We have okay. so much we could talk about. But... Okay. What are species, what species are well suited to being broadcast into soybeans? Oh, yeah. That's a great question. Yeah. Okay. I like this one. Um, so with broadcasting into soybeans, um, it's really time sensitive. Um, you you really want to hit the timing just before leaf drop. Um, and that's because when you're broadcasting, you're just throwing it on the surface. And once the leaves drop, it's essentially creating a mat in between the soil mm -hmm. and whatever seed you're dropping on top of it. So you really want to um, get in there before leaf drop. Okay. And um, in terms of species, I guess, I'd be looking at your fall cereals. Um, yeah would be the easiest thing, especially at that point you're getting later in the season. Um, those are gonna establish fairly easily, fairly well, um, and then kind of see you through the rest of the fall. Yeah, that's kind of easy too. Yeah. You know, yeah. Management wise. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But but timing is definitely number one. Right. With that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. We have one <laughs> we have one minute left. What do do a, we'll squeeze one in. Squeeze one in. Um okay. What cover crops can I grow after strawberry harvest? Sunny Berry, yeah, Sunny Murray. That's a, okay. <laughs> that's a short question, but a long answer. Uh, <laughs> I think what you really want to do is look at uh, what herbicides you're using. So if you use the uh, Sinbar at a high application at Christmas time or uh, Sinbar in the spring, it really limits uh, what's available. So last year we did a... Uh, a cover crop trial where we sprayed all of our uh, herbicides in one direction and planted all of the uh, uh, cover crops in the yeah. other direction. And the only thing that came through on the sin bar was the uh, uh, pearl millet. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would look at pearl millet uh, would be my my first uh, choice yeah. if you had a sin bar. Uh, most of the other herbicides we use uh, uh, don't... Uh, don't hinder a cover crop establishment, so it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. okay. That's it. Great. That's it.
Oh, thank you, you too. That, that went nice. really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, there's definitely, yeah. Uh, if you have questions that you ask that we didn't answer, feel free to reach out to us directly um, and we would be happy to talk. We love talking about cover yeah. crops, so yeah. we'd be happy to talk about them some more. And we have the link for the survey. Um, please fill that out um, when you have time. It's really valuable to us um, and lets us know if we need to do or want to do or if you guys want us to do another one of these. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for all the great Yeah, questions. thank you for... Thank you for joining us. Oh, Lindsay put up the uh, CCA oh, yeah. credits there. Um, if anybody needs those. And yeah, thanks again. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. <laughs>